Today, uh, besides being tech support, um, very bad tech support, <laughs> I'd like to talk to you about the rise of um, life in our oceans. And um, I'm going to do this um, through a number of stories. I've got 10 stories to tell you. But before I get there, let me uh, first do a little bit of an introduction of who I am and where I come from. So um, ever since I was a little kid, I was the kid with the dirt on me, uh, always looking for rocks and fossils and interesting things um, in natural history. So I started out being super interested in rocks. Then I got really interested in biology, in life. And of course, uh, life but rock plus rocks equals fossils. And um, so for my masters, I studied paleontology. And I come from the Eastern Cape. Um, so I studied at the Nelson Mandela University uh, there in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so yeah, I forgot to mention throughout my presentation, you are more than welcome to ask questions, please. I want it to be more of a conversation. So just stick your hand up and ask a question if you have one. And I have also got some goodies in the front here, a couple of fossils and rocks that I'm gonna circulate throughout my talk so that you can have a little bit of a break from the speaky speaky and a bit of the hand thing, you know? <laughs> it's always fun. Okay, so um, I started out my career as a geologist um, for the Geological Survey. And the Geological Survey makes maps in South Africa. So that's all the geological maps that you see. Um, those were made by survey geologists like I was. And I walked through a number of pair of shoes. Um, <laughs> uh, this is me walking through shoes at the Langebaan area. I was studying um, really old dune snails. Not really old. I mean, they were only four million years. Pfft, four million years, what's this? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was busy studying those guys. Uh, and when I got sick of using my feet, I used quad bikes. I've also swam across rivers for fossils and navigated the oceans for fossils on really bad sinking little ships. And I have also done airborne surveys with helicopters looking for fossils. So I'm a little bit dedicated, as you can see, uh, using every means possible to study life on Earth. And at the moment, I'm a curator here at the museum. Um, so let me tell you a little bit. So when I started here, I actually had no idea really what a curator did. I'm, 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 I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you this, but I didn't really know what my job entailed. <laughs> then I arrived here and I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to be able to work on research. I knew that part. And what I do is I study two major extinction events. I study life about 440 million years ago, um, just after the mass extinction event. Um, at the time, and those are in the rocks of the Cedarberg. So there's me with a sledgehammer looking at rocks uh, from the Cedarberg. And then the other thing I study is fossils from the Karoo. And the fossils in the Karoo tell the story about extinction on land. One of the most amazing examples that we have of fossils preserved, um, like an amazing ecosystem, 200 million years of evolution of um, terrestrial animals tetrapods and so that's the other thing that I study okay um, I also work on exhibitions I take ones that are old down and I reinstall new ones with the help of the exhibition team um, I run a lab where, where I have um, preparators who are slowly slowly taking the rock from the fossils um, and I really enjoy this part of my job which is science communication and supporting the education um, units um, because what's the point of doing science if you can't communicate it to people, right? Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other things. I should put this particular thing here, administration, like actually that should be in bold, like it should be an entire slide. I did not study to be an administrator, but, 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 and I see it's a common problem. <laughs> um, but whatever, we get to do really cool things anyway besides that. Um, okay. So let's get on to today's talk. We can't talk about evolution of life without one of these uh, time scales. And I know the names are a little bit annoying and having to teach them to kids is like, I can imagine, it's pretty awful because um, they're difficult to pronounce a lot of the time. But it does provide a framework for us to be able to understand deep time, at least a little bit. At least as much as something that, like organisms that live, what, how long can we maximum life of a human? 120? So 120 years we can live maximum, and we need to try and understand things that are billions of years old. Yeah, We don't have much of a hope unless we have some kind of framework. Okay, so today's talk, 
I'm going to be using selected sites, which I've shown here on this little map in with the yellow stars. And each of those sites tells us a story about life evolving in, in oceans from a South African perspective. Because we always hear about the European examples, but we have the most amazing examples here in South Africa. So I've chosen these 10 sites to like proudly South African uh, show you guys um, some amazing fossils. Okay, so basically this, the, this uh, time scale and this map is going to be your, like, when you get to number five, you can be like, okay, cool, we're halfway. Number six, okay, Claire's almost done talking. Um, <laughs> so it's also a good way to know where we are in the presentation. Okay, cool. So uh, let's start kind of in the beginning, I guess. Um, the Earth was not always a hospitable place, definitely not. Uh, when it started out, it was pretty, like, nasty. They called it the Hadean, right? Like, hell on Earth. Uh, and before life could evolve, we needed a couple of things to happen. Firstly, we needed the Earth to cool enough that you could have crusts forming. And then we needed oceans. And we've already heard um, about how water ca could come from outer space, right? Um, but we're still not quite sure where life came from. And there are a couple of theories about, well, a couple meaning two, theories of the origin of life. And this is still like hotly debated. The most basic question, how did life form, is super hotly debated. But there is some evidence to support the idea that the building box of life so um, the, the chemical building blocks um, came in from outer space, similar to how water probably came onto our planet. And we're not talking about little green aliens like flying in on a meteorite, nothing like that. It's not life itself, it's the building blocks to be able to enable life um, to form on the planet. And then the other theory is the primordial soup. So you have something similar to like mid-oceanic ridges um, there are today where there's lots of methane spewing out, it's really hot and the idea is that life might have evolved in a place similar to that right here on Earth, the building blocks for life at least. But that's still hotly debated. We do know though from the fossil record that the oldest form of life is about 3.7 billion years old. So whenever I use this GA, it's billion years. If I use MA, it's million years. Okay, and here we are on our first proudly South African site. Stromatolites, I see Wendy's super excited. Um, Wendy, we'll get to Wendy's amazing deposits now, but she studies these, these guys. So basically stromatolites are these uh, fossilized, well, now they're fossilized, um, but when you find them in the rocks, they fossilize microbial mats of small little organisms uh, or little photosynthetic organisms, right? So they might look like an, an individual animal, but they're actually just these colonies of individuals. Um, and they're some of the earliest uh, life forms that we find. And in South Africa, we have got some stromatolites that are 3.4 billion years old. Super duper duper old. <laughs> and they're found in a place called Barberton. So here we are on the time scale, we're like not even, like we're here with the little, little nasty critters over there, uh, and so we have stromatolites. And this is what they look like. So you can see these like dome structures over here. They're actually well illustrated in this picture here. But it's, I mean, it's pretty convincing. Like you can't really make that up. So there's stromatolites from Barberton that tell us that life existed on South African rocks about 3.4 billion years ago. Okay, um, and you know how often we think about um, the planet affecting life, right? Continental drift happens and that affects how animals evolve, things like that. We often don't think about the reverse of that. So how life has actually affected our planet. And here's a really good example of how that happened. And that was when photosynthesis made the whole earth rust. And if you've ever owned a car or you've seen a car you, you kind of at, at the coast, you know that when as soon as you scrape the paint off of it, it's going to start rusting, right? That's because it's being exposed to oxygen. Exactly the same thing happened during the great oxygenation event on Earth's history. And what happened was these little cyanobacteria were like happily running around doing their cyanobacteria thing. And after a certain amount of time, they produced enough oxygen. There was a critical mass of oxygen in the atmosphere that suddenly the rocks 
on Earth that were never really exposed to that much oxygen suddenly rusted. Boom, all of them gone, pff, rust. And we find this on lots of different continents all over the world. So we know that it was a global event that happened. And I think it's pretty amazing that life caused that. You know, it's like a byproduct. And the cyanobacteria weren't going, hey, let's try to rust stuff. It's just this amazing byproduct of like life evolving on the planet. And in South Africa, here comes actually to my first hand samples. Um, in South Africa, we have banded iron stone. And I'm going to pass these around because they, they're really heavy. You can actually feel how much iron there is um, in the rocks. Here's a core, um, which was drilled from mine. Um, pass that one. Um, and basically that mine is uh, around Kuruman, called Sishin. And it's amazing because it's one of the, um, one of the places where we get iron ore. So it's uh, pretty good for the economy of South Africa. And if you go visit that place, you're pretty much going to be orange from like head to toe, right? Like you can't get that stuff out. You're going to be blowing your nose and it's going to be orange. Um, but it's pretty amazing. So that's all because of oxygenation. Okay. On to Wendy's favorite site. <laughs> so Wendy and her team study um, the Ediacaran. And the Ediacaran um, is a period where we, we had simple life forms and now we had the evolution of complex organisms. So we're talking multicellular organisms, not just these domes that were made of individual little cells, but an animal was like the form of an animal was starting to come out. Okay. And um, there's still like a lot of controversies about the classification of these animals because honestly, you can't tell the head from the tail. Like you don't even know, even if they have a head or have a butt, like you, you can't tell a lot of the time. <laughs> so, so there's a lot of question about these, but they're still massively fascinating. And some of the really greatest examples are from this area over here, basically just on the border between South Africa and Namibia. And it's kind of known as the Nama group. And here we are on the time scale. We, we're like just tipping into the Phanerozoic, which is basically the time when, the, when life evolved. So well, this is like pre-Cambrian, Cambrian boundary over here that we're at the time we're looking at. So about 550 million years old. So you see we've changed now to from billion to million. It's like the time is quite crazy, like <laughs> three billion years to million years, big gap. Um, anyway, this is Wendy and her team having a look at these amazing fossils. Um, I forgot to say that this is a reconstruction of what that environment might have looked like um, done by Maggie Newman. And if you get that picture in your head and then get that picture in your head, <laughs> It's kind of different, right? <laughs> so we study marine rocks, but we study them on land and they look so different. Um, you have to have an amazing imagination to be a paleontologist. And here are some of the really cool critters that um, when your new team are finding. So you get the body fossils, like these guys over here, and they're the fossil examples. But they're also these amazing things like trace fossils. So you know, dinosaur footprints, um, that's an example of trace fossils. It's the behavior of animals that's recorded in the rocks in the absence of their bodies, right? And in this example, you see those scratchy circ those circles over there? They actually go all the way around. This rock, this rock is broken in between them, but that gives uh, evidence that there was an animal that, had, uh, that was fixed to the bottom of the sea and it was moving around with the ocean currents. And so as it was moving around, there were parts of it that were making those scratch circles. So although we don't have the animal preserved, we do know that an animal like that existed. Do. Oh, do you? Which one? Is it this guy? Is it this one? Ha! Huh, there you go. Perfect. So we do have them. Um, so there's this amazing uh, diversity of life um, in the Nama. And I'd love to show you more examples because there are so many examples. But this is actually my favorites. You're not supposed to have favorites, but I totally have favorites. And this is one. So these guys are disc, small disc shaped um, fossils. And inside them, on, on the top, they kind of look like these little blistery things. You can confuse them. You can walk over them like, ah, it's a nodule, pfft, whatever. But they're actually amazing when you look at them inside. And I've got a video here, courtesy of Wendy. Um, so if you CT scan these fossils and you like, like if you broke your arm and you wanted to see where the crack was, you'd, you'd get a, a CT scan. You can do that for rocks too. And here is a video of one of these little guys 
CT scanned. Never before found in South Africa. These are the first occurrences. And when he's finding so many of them now. So do you see those, those little chambers and things like that? Mm -hmm. there's, there's biological structure within these. And am I right, Wendy, in saying that they're probably very similar to sponges? So relative. relative yeah. Know. So like a very early ancestor maybe of sponges, but <coughs> like I said, you can't tell tail from head. <laughs> so it's very difficult to classify where these guys even fit into the story of life. But it's a pretty cool scan. And they're pretty small. That, that one right there that you're seeing, the CT scan, is only about this big. Most of them are kind of small. But they're very cool. They're super cool. Millimeters like a coin, yeah. Yeah, so Eddie Akron, I'm sure that you can f tell Wendy, all your, ask Wendy all your questions. I'm going to put them over that direction. <laughs> um, so let's move on from the Eddie Akron. And now we're going to go to one of my favorite topics, because this is what I study, and that's the Cedarberg. So uh, we spoke, I don't know if I mentioned the extinctions, but I mean, you, pro you guys know all about the extinctions. There are five massive extinction events that have happened on Earth. There are a couple of other smaller ones, but we're like, meh, 60% of life dies, meh. <laughs> so it kind of cut off is around like sort of 70%. And the first mass extinction that happens is here in the um, late Ordovician. And this is the second largest extinction event that ever happened on the planet. About 85% of everything died. And there were only a couple of little like algae and fungi and stuff on, the, on land. So we're talking about death of marine creatures, because that's all there really was. Land creatures were not evolved yet. And so I study the recovery just after, see the little arrows just above that extinction event? I study the fossils that record the recovery after this <laughs> extinction event. And here's a reconstruction of um, the site that I look at, and it's around the Cedarberg area. And, um, yeah, you can start to recognize some creatures, right? Like they don't look as weird as the Diacaran. So you can see things like the ancestors of squids. And these guys over here are jawless fish. And this over here is a conodont. And I'll show you some more pictures of that. But it's basically a really early vertebrate ancestor. Acted a bit like a hagfish, was pretty nasty. But it is pretty cool in evolutionary terms. And I promised you a picture of a conodont, here it is. Um, actually, the first conodont ever described or ever discovered um, was from South Africa. So in Europe, they used to find all these little weird, um, like th this structure, these structures. And they didn't know what they were. Some people called them land plants. Others, like, didn't really know. And so until in South Africa, we found a fossil of this guy, the soft body tissue preserved, uh, we didn't know where it came from. Um, and this is why South Africa, the South African deposit actually is so remarkable, because of soft tissue preservation. So normally, right, if you walk around in the exhibits and you look at dinosaur bones, those dinosaur bones are the hard tissues of an animal that are preserved, right? But the skin and the eyes and the livers and the little muscles between your ribs, that stuff very, very seldom gets preserved, except under extremely amazing circumstances. And one of those examples is from the Cedarberg Formation. Here, you can see the eye shields of this animal. Now, bear in mind, those are 440 million year old soft tissue eye shields of an animal that was one of our really, really, really earliest ancestors as vertebrates. It's pretty amazing. And here, you see these little white things. Those are the muscle fibers between the ribs of the animal, known as myomeres. And so we, we also get livers and kidneys and all kinds of weird things preserved in, this, in the Cedarberg formation. Um, here's another example of a really good fossil called the Eurypterid, which is this guy over here. It's an extinct type of sea scorpion. Um, okay, so the, thing <laughs> so the thing that I'm super fascinated in actually um, and what I'm researching at the moment is the small food web. Now, everybody likes the big things like whales and dolphins and stuff, but I am really fascinated about how the tiny things are able to support the big things, okay? And one of the examples of um, tiny things in the ocean that, that um, support big things is marine snow. 
And of course, it's not like land snow where everyone's like, oh, land snow. It's really cool. It's these, these blooms that happen um, normally seasonally, and they're in response to like increased light um, in summer and spring, but also to increase nutrients um, output. So algal blooms have got like a bit of a bad rap in modern culture as well, because they can kind of form when you have pollution effluent coming out of the rivers and things like that. But here we're talking about um, algal blooms that are forming quite naturally. Um, and there's evidence of algal blooms in these rocks as well. And so this is an example of what the mud rock looks like. And you've, you can find, actually I have some more the, another sample. Here, uh, I'm gonna pass it around, but there's a little black thing over here. And if you turn it around, you'll find, if you look very carefully, a couple of other little black bits and bobs. Those are fossil algae, 440 million year old fossil algae. I'm gonna pass it around. Um, but basically all along those mud rock slabs is this algae. And so I started to wonder what fossils could we find associated with these algae? Because you've seen the big fossils that come out of the deposit, but there's like, in order to see the tiny stuff, you have to use um, tech really specialized techniques. And so similar to what um, Wendy did, I used a CT scanner and I was able to find the burrows of these guys, nematodes, and the burrows of these guys, foraminifera. And we're talking benthic forams because forams in the water column hadn't evolved yet. Planktonic forams not evolved yet. And so within these mud rocks of the Cedarberg formation is this repeated pattern of marine snow, nematodes, and forams exploiting that marine snow. So I found 440 million year old example of the small food web and how that small food web supports the evolution or the diversification of larger organisms within the marine systems. It turns out this is really cool and very important because after mass extinction events, opportunistic species, small species, the little guys that nobody cares about, they're the ones that are supporting the diversification of life on the planet again. Okay, so if you want to be something in evolutionary time, be small and squishy. <laughs> That's the lesson. Don't evolve all these little hard parts and stuff. Puff, you'll go extinct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're on to site five. So this is my little nephew, Nathan, and he's really excited because he's found his first fossil. Uh, and it turns out to be a fossil from the Borkefeld group around Ceres area. Okay, it's a brachiopod fossil. So this kind of shellfish went extinct, but bivalves are around. And I've got some examples I can show you here. Um, these are bivalves, so like mussels basically. I pass them along. Here's an example of a brachiopod, so this is one of those that went extinct. You can tell by the ridges on the shell, like kind of what it is. If it's flat, it's normally a bivalve. If it's like ridgy, ridgy, it's usually a brachiopod in this example. Um, so I'm going to pass that around. And then the other little guys I'm going to pass around are kind of my favorites. Again, not supposed to have favorites, but um, that's these guys over here, the trilobites. So we have two examples. I'm passing around the ones that are the most like robust, but if you want to come have a look, I've got in those trays, I've got lots of other examples, but they're just a bit fragile. So I'm going to pass these guys around. And I see we have a question. What um, the I have a slide about that. Can, can we get to it when we get to the start? Thank you. Perfect. So, um, hey Claire. Yeah. In your bag, you have those rulers. Mm -hmm. There's a little magnifier at the end. So you can pull that out and you can actually look a little bit closer on it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Now everyone's going to go to their bags. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Log to one of your sites. Like just for fun. Yeah. Just give me your name afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We must make it work. Okay, so I'm just going to talk really loudly over the sound of bags opening. <laughs> you know what? I'm super excited because, like, looking at fossils with hand lens is my favorite thing to do, so I get it. Um, 
But we're talking now in the Bokofelt around just before the Devonian mass extinction event. And I wanted to point out, besides these fossils that we have over here, so this, this is an early ancestor of squids and things like that, but here's a fossilized human, uh, <laughs> that's Kieran at the back there, he's my um, sometimes willing field assistant um, and partner. <laughs> um, okay, so we're on to site number six. And if you want to take some photos and things of these fossils, you're more than welcome. We'll just put some good lighting on and there's some great examples on the tray. They're just quite fragile. So after my talk, you can have a look. Okay, cool. So on to site number six. So now we'll be talking about after the Devonian mass extinction event and we're talking about life in estuaries. So this is going to start looking a little bit more like modern day because, so we're over here on the timeline, and what we find here now is the first kind of land plants that are really recognizable like trees and um, you also have plants within the estuaries that are also kind of recognizable and have a look at the bottom over here what's what do you think that is it's a fish right but more specifically silicanth. yes it's a freaking coelacanth it's a 360 million year old freaking coelacanth <laughs> but not only is it a coelacanth it's the first example of a coelacanth nursery so it's baby coelacanths with their yolk sacs still attached to them how freaking cool is that not only the adults but yolk sacs and this site is amazing for a number of reasons um, also the preservation like we spoke about with the cedarberg um, but also because of the diversification of life that we see here so that's a coelacanth and coelacanth babies this is a Eurypterid. Remember we spoke about sea scorpions. They made it through the Devonian extinction. Yay, yay, happy. Uh, and then they have things like placoderm fish and some sharks and things. Also from around this time, the first tetrapods, so things that walk on four legs, were emerging from the seas. Um, and so we have in South Africa some of the earliest examples of tetrapods coming on land. And that's from this site near Makanda. Other examples, remember I told you about the coelacanth, there's an example of it squished in the rock. Here's an example of some of the um, seaweeds that were preserved. This is a placoderm. And here we have lampreys. We actually have the earliest example of a lamprey in the world. And not only do we have that, we have the example, an example of the embryonic development of lampreys because we've got all the life uh, fossils of baby lampreys like all the way through to adult lampreys. And so this is a super significant site globally, not just in South Africa. And Very cool. And they still exist. Indeed, they do. So they made it past the Devonian mass extinction, like the PT boundary, all of them. <laughs> Some guys are really survivors. And they're not a worm, which is, yeah. Um, okay, on to site number seven. So we're now around 280 million years ago. And we're going to start talking about swimming reptiles. This over here is a mesosaur, and um, it was thriving in the seas of the Karoo around, we found really good examples of these animals around Tankwa, Tankwa area. And this period in geological time is marked by a series of glaciations or ice ages. And we call it the Dwyker glaciation. Glaciers were kind of building in, retreating, building in and retreating. And when they finally retreated, there was a lot of water around. And so you get these marine deposits just after the glaciation that have some really cool things. They have microfossils, they have some fish, but they also have these swimming reptiles. And one of my favorite things about these swimming reptiles is they actually used um, ballast in their tummies to um, maintain their buoyancy. So they're like eight stones and stuff. And you can find those stones preserved in some of these fossils um, where the tummy is of the mes uh, mosasaur. And that tells us the behavior of this animal, what it was doing. It also kind of tells us where it was swimming because rocks are quite distinctive, right? If it's swimming over there and there were like iron stones and it was like heavy and it's swimming over there and there were like corals and it was like a light mosasaur, you can kind of tell regionally things about the animal, right? Okay. Yes. And just imagine how big they were. Um, small, yeah, they, they are quite small. I think, sure, I'm actually not sure what the range they're is, big, but, they're, they're but they're actually pretty small. They're not like Jurassic Park style, some, you know, swimming reptiles. But we do have some of those and I'm going to get to those now. 
swimming reptiles 355 million years. So now we've passed the, we've actually gone pretty far in this timeline, right? We've passed the Devonian mass extinction. That was the fossils of um, my fossils and the Cedarberg, the series fossils. Then we worked into the Carboniferous, which is somewhere there, yes. Then there's the Echo Sea. And we've passed the mother of all extinctions, which is the Permian mass extinction event. In South Africa, we don't have marine fossils from the Permian, but we do have land fossils. Uh, so we've skipped past that. We've even gone past the Triassic extinction, and now we're close to the, the extinction everybody cares about, which is the dinosaur extinction, asteroids, <laughs> dinosaurs dying uh, left and right. And so before this, um, we have a diversity of animals from these areas, and they looked a bit like this. So does anybody recognize, I don't know how many Jurassic Park people there are in the audience, but these guys, uh, Mosasaurs, were kind of featured in there. Yeah. So we have South African examples. We have three specimens, might be three different species, we're not quite sure. And I had one of them being prepared in my lab a couple of months ago. Here's what the lower jaw of this guy looks like. But they're also uh, things like ammonites. There's one on the table there. Oh, yeah. Here's a reconstruction of an ammonite. And he wants to play with the ammonites. Um, and then we also have my favorite, you're not supposed to have fires again, but I really like this fossil. Um, it's a plesiosaur, it's the only one we have from Africa, actually, uh, as far as I know, um, Leptoclidus capensis. And there's its flipper, and there's its head. And that's in our collections here. Okay, uh, so now we go past the massive extinction event. South Africa doesn't have um, a very good record of this because it kind of, yeah, there's lots of reasons for it, we can go into those later, but basically the um, dinosaur extinction is mostly rec recorded offshore um, South Africa. There's an example of it, you can, if you drill there you can see it, but a large part, most of the tertiary in South Africa is missing and um, only a little bit of the Cretaceous is, is there. So when you say missing, you mean it eroded. eroded away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we skip that <laughs> and then we move on to more recent stuff. Um, so when you saw me walking through my shoes earlier on, that was four million year old dune snails. Um, and in that, in that same deposit around Langebahnwach, you find these guys, fossilized bits of whales, dolphins and seals. And does anybody know what these things are? <coughs> Any guesses? I mean, your options are whale, dolphin or seal. What, 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 what do you think they belong to? <laughs> <laughs> You'd think seal, right? They're actually the inner ears of whales. Yeah? And what's cool about them is that they're super diagnostic. So if you pick up, if you're like a whale ear expert and you pick up one of these, you're like, oh yes, oh, this is a pygmy right, blah, blah, blah. Um, so they're, they're super distinctive. And so, yeah, we study these guys in the West Coast Fossil Park. And we're on to number 10. Okay, so here's mass extinctions, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so this, in the little infographic, basically it's saying that there are a couple of causes of mass extinction events. Now, of course, the meteorite impact is like every, the one everybody thinks about, and it is probably one of the, the leading causes for the uh, dinosaur extinction, or at least the non-avian dinosaur extinction. Um, volcanism is probably the leading cause for the end Permian mass extinction. So that was when the Deccan traps, traps and things like that was massive outpourings of these lavas and the nasty chemicals that come from that affected the, the planet's climate. Um, they affected things like air temperature, they affected oceanic circulation, all kinds of things. Of course we know that um, there are the Earth is a super integrated system and so there are multiple factors that often cause these massive shifts. Okay, um, but what I want to focus on now, um, while we, when we talk about uh, currently what kind of animals we have um, being preserved in the fossil record, so what could we have preserved in the future and how can our actions impact the fossil record? Um, so I want to talk about um, oxygen levels and about ocean acidification in the next slide. And thanks to humans, we can add humans as another cause for mass extinctions because we are uh, causing the latest mass extinction event, the sixth mass extinction event. Um, climate change in the past is real, it was happening, but we've accelerated it and we can't deny our impact. So we're going to be talking about microfossils. 
and mostly they're preserved offshore and that's what they look like. And what do you reckon they are made out of? What's their composition? They're shells, right? So calcium carbonate, yeah? And we know that if you drop acid onto calcium carbonate, it dissolves. So what's happening is because our atmosphere is more concentrated in carbon dioxide, uh, that's diffusing into the water and basically causing the oceans to be more acidic. And these little guys over here, especially the forams that are basically small food web guys, so we, we know they're really important, right? They're the base of the food chain. What they're unable to do is to produce their little shells. But if they do produce them, they produce really, sh really <laughs> shitty <laughs> versions. I was going to say thin versions and then a shitty came out, so you know, same, same difference. Um, <laughs> very shitty thin shells. Um, and that's really crappy for an animal, right? Because what are you going to do? That's your home. You don't have anywhere else to be. Um, and so we, as organisms on the planet, have affected these little guys so much that they can't build their shells. Now imagine if acidification just accelerates or gets worse, or continues, that's not going to be in the fossil record, right? It's going to be dissolved away. So people, paleontologists later, like, <laughs> they come from Mars or whatever, come to the fossil record and they go, wait, <laughs> there were four amps here, and then there were none, and then like, maybe some of them are going to survive. Look, life is resilient, something will come along, but there's going to be this gap, right? And it's probably going to be because of us. So, yeah, we affect fossils. But I don't like the idea of doom and gloom because climate change is, while it is very real, we can't become, we can't lack in hope as we try to uh, change what we're doing, right? We actually need hope because without hope you don't have action. Without action we can't lobby our governments, we can't make changes that we need to make. And so this is a really cool podcast I actually just wanted to make you guys aware of um, where S uh, you're looking at scientific reasons to have hope and to try and um, we have to acknowledge that there's a problem but we have to move through it together. <laughs> uh, so I actually have hope for humanity. Um, some examples of that are conservation efforts. So in South Africa we have a lot of marine protected areas for example. Uh, and so you know that's a really good thing, that's a way to, to um, prevent biodiversity loss. But the other thing I wanted to highlight is research and innovation. So museums, for example, museum scientists, work on a huge diversity of different current animals, um, and marine animals, and we have to do this to, in order to understand how the present day ecosystems work so that we can try to mitigate problems in the future. So it's very important to have institutions like museums. Um, a lot of people think it's just dead fossils lying around, you know, like things in jars, and it is that, but it, it's also this archive of biological history. And without preserving museums, without that archive, we can't see where we're going in the future because we don't then have a past, right? So museums are very important keys and research at museums is very important for helping us to move through climate action, climate change action. And that is it, if there are any questions or comments. <laughs>